It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this morning, uh, Mr. Seth Anderson. Seth was in the eighth grade when he began attending Caldwell Academy in 1998. The school was uh, still in its infancy. At that time, the school was still located at Rehoboth Church Road, and he graduated in 2003 with the close-knit class of only six. Seth went on to, to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he majored in business administration through the Kenan Flagler School of Business. After college, Seth worked at Trone Brand Energy, focusing on influencer marketing in the education, healthcare, and animal health categories. In 2014, he began working in Winston-Salem at the Winston-Salem Industries for the Blind the world's largest employer of people who are blind or visually impaired. Currently, Seth directs marketing for the organization, leading a team that manages retail and product marketing, corporate communications, media relations, and events. Seth is married to Katie Liebman, also a Caldwell graduate in 2007. Today, they live in Greensboro with their three children, Crosby, 10 months, Blythe, who is almost four, and Alden, who is six. Alden is Caldwell Academy's first Eagle Legacy student and will be completing his kindergarten year in Mrs. Sneed's class in a few days. Please join me in welcoming Caldwell alumnus Seth Anderson. So if you want to know anything about the poise of this senior class, you would know from my perspective sitting right there, I'm watching a spider go down and up and down and up as Grayson talked. It stayed in the same place while Rachel was up there, but it was moving around a lot with Grayson, so it's dead now. <laughs> so I want to say thank you very much to Mr. Cox, um, to the Caldwell Board for your service, much of which goes unknown, so very much appreciate you guys. Um, say thanks to the teachers for your commitment and consistent passion to classical education, and uh, thanks to the administrative staff for all that you guys do to keep things moving. And I want to say congratulations to the graduates. We're here today doing this because of what you have done, because you have engaged with the work that your teachers and mentors have put in front of you, and because you've proven yourself worthy. So congratulations. It's, it's not common in our day to have ceremonies. We have baptisms and funerals and weddings, but when you really think about it, celebrating personal milestones in a way with a ceremony with this many people is something special. And I know that I feel very privileged to be here today to be a part of that celebration. So when Mr. Greer called to ask if I would consider speaking, my first thought was, I mean, really, what do I have to talk about? What could I contribute? And I, my, that was my first thought. My second thought was, I, I hate graduation speakers because they are standing. They're the last thing between you and getting that diploma, and you've got to sit there and listen to them, and there's a party afterwards, and they're keeping you from that. And so because I like parties very much, I will not keep you from that party for long. <laughs> so who am I? My connection to Caldwell is uh, it's pretty strong, pretty deep. There's a lot in the, uh, the web of that. Um, at one point, my wife, my mother my brother, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law, and one of my brothers-in-law all worked at Caldwell. <laughs> I met my wife in ninth grade geometry class. Now I have a son, Alden, who is in kindergarten in Mrs. Sneed's class, who is a woman proven herself of just boundless patience and uh, very much appreciate all the things that Alden's been able to experience um, in her class. My mom, Piper, sits on the board, and my sister-in-law, Amy, manages marketing. And then my mother-in-law is, of course, none other than Leslie Liebman, who many of you seniors have learned so much from. So I've learned not to take my deep connections to the school for granted. I'm thankful for them. I'm thankful for the sacrifices my parents made that allowed me to attend Caldwell. And I'm a proud alumni. I, can, I believe that successful organizations have a strong mission, and its people are wholly bought into that mission. They not only believe it, but they live it. And I can attest that the passion for biblical and Christ-centered classical education is as strong now as it was when it was the K through ninth grade school, adding a, year, a grade every year, when I joined in 1998, operated out of trailers off of Rehoboth Church Road. 
I was the second graduating class, which my wife would debate because she was a class of one and technically she's the first, so you could say I'm the third, I suppose. But I got to do a lot of things in my time at Caldwell, given its small size and how we were constantly trying new things. Some of those were successful, and some of them I look back on our itty-bitty little thin yearbooks and kind of cringe a little bit. I was here when we were planning the first Caldwell dance. I remember being in a meeting, and Alice Wolf looked at the room and said, well, we can't just call it that thing in the spring, but apparently we could, and we did. <laughs> it was my class that gave the rock as our senior gift, as much as to create traditions as to create the proverbial white elephant just like the class before me that gave the eagle in the gym and they wrote their names like this tall on there, we knew that we would have something in front of the school. People would remember us. They just wouldn't let us put our names that big on the top of it. I remember seeing Joe Curlot's face when we announced what it would be. You could just tell that he knew what an aesthetic and maintenance nightmare it would be. <laughs> and so because I have to publicly express my amazement at what Joe has done to Caldwell's campus and how those trailers... Those are the same ones that I went, I, I had eighth grade science in them. So they look amazing. He has frozen them in time. I also have sort of noticed that whatever magic potion Joe uses with those trailers, he also spreads on Adam Greer, who I don't think has aged at all since I was a student at Caldwell. So I'm going to be honest and say, I don't know that class that well. I've heard stories about them. I had such a pleasure reading um, through the yearbook that my son got this week and seeing your pictures and your senior, um, your, the, the things you passed on to others. Um, I, I think I've watched very carefully as I've dropped my son off in carpool to what you guys have done with, with my rock, with our rock. And if there's one thing I do know about you guys is that none of y'all are going to be artists. It took me a really long time after Valentine's Day to figure out what the heck a cagrel was. What's a cagrel? And so I, I even Googled it. Like, cagrel. Like, why would Caldwell heart cagrels? And then my sister-in-law, Amy, pointed out that it was C-A girls. That they heart C-A girls. And so perhaps in college you will learn about kerning and the importance of doing that. <laughs> I think on the bright side, none of you guys are going to get arrested as a result of any graffiti because you just don't know how to use spray paint. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here comes the emotion. <laughs> so, um, this is such... Really, the fact that I get... Here we go. <laughs> To stand in here and share with you guys, really, very few of us ever get a chance to publicly share what something means to you personally on this kind of scale. And so I feel very privileged to do this. I knew I was going to get emotional. I grabbed this. This is actually a napkin. This is not some fancy pop-up square. This is like a Pizza Hut napkin I got out of my car. And I had to actually cut this out with like a plastic knife because I couldn't find one of the 18 million multi-tools my dad's given me over the years, which you would think I would have in the car. So anyway, just warming you. So I love the opener from 1 John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and we have heard, so that you also may follow with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete." And so I speak with you today, working towards making my joy complete, of sharing with you what God has done. To me, loving others always seemed like such an easy concept. Don't overthink it. Just love people. Like, it's not that hard. Just don't hate them. I mean, really, like, how, how can that be that difficult? But knowing that and practicing it, for me, has been a real journey. So I graduated from Caldwell with all these tools to do process information, and communicate my thoughts. But I entered UNC Chapel Hill in the fall of 2003, really scared to engage anyone that was different than me. My freshman year there, God led me to an important realization. He, he created me the way that he wanted me to be and that he loved me the way that I was. I had spent so much time trying to be perfect to earn the love of the people around me, of 
those to, for which I was doing things like school or extracurricular activities or programs that I was involved in, and really at the core of it, trying to earn God's love and acceptance. But God very clearly that freshman year said to me, I, I will make, I will make you perfect. Jesus died so that you may be perfect. Quit trying to do it yourself. As you can imagine, not living in the fullness of his love, not living as created in his image for his glory, meant that I certainly wasn't engaging others in that way. And God really broke me that first year. There's nothing sweeter than acknowledging in your heart that salvation cannot be earned and accepting his gift of freedom and forgiveness. So I'd love to say, even through that, my freshman year, I was fixed, it was done, I checked the box, but really the rest of college and through my first years of marriage, having children, working at an advertising agency, I lived in some of the knowledge of how he loved me and created me in his image for a specific purpose, but not in the fullness of it, because God wasn't done with me yet. So my wife and I have three kids, Alden, who I mentioned is finishing his kindergarten year here, he's six and a half, Blythe is almost four, and Crosby is ten months. We named our children Alden, Blythe, Crosby, A, B, C, so we could help keep them organized. And then we decided that three was enough, and there was absolutely nothing we could do beyond that. But our life is sort of insane and crazy with travel, with my job, keeping the kids alive. And uh, my wife is a growing creative illustration and design business that she does with her sister. So when Blythe was born in 2012, um, we were stunned to learn that she had Down syndrome. I never previously had much experience with people with disabilities, um, any sort of disability, and a lot of us don't. So I really wish that I could say in that time that I didn't have the feelings and think the thoughts of, like, Lord, why? Like, seriously? Like, this is, no, I don't, I don't want to do this. But what has been cool is that as she grew, it was so very, very apparent that she is her own person. <clears throat> and that not just her mom and dad love her, but God loves her. This was further reinforced when in 2013 I had the opportunity to interview at Winston-Salem Ministries for the Blind. I was blown away by what I saw there. Here were people with a presumably devastating disability, thriving. Not thriving because of some able-bodied person's guilt or they were taking pity on these people, but these were people doing the same jobs as their sighted peers, all because they were empowered. These were people, just like me, who God had created and loved and wanted to share in glorifying him. They had talents and gifts, and here they were using them. It would be easy for me to talk for an hour about where I work and my job, and the short story, as Sam said in the introduction, is that I'm the director of marketing there. Director of marketing there. Basically, anything that has to do with how it's said or how it looks is in the purview of my team across our three manufacturing sites, 50 retail operations, eight main lines of business, and nearly 1,000 employees. It's, it's a great honor, and it's also terrifying to be in that level of responsibility for a group of people like this. And... I would say it's that responsibility that has really changed my mindset, but the single biggest change in recent years for me and my thinking is not being inspired by a person with a visual impairment sewing a military uniform or creating a pair of glasses for a veteran. It's the language that I, learned, that I have learned to use there. People first language. So what, what, is, what is people first language? So quite simply in my world, it's saying a person who is blind versus a blind person. A girl who has a visual impairment not a blind girl. It's allowing folks to be identified as a person first, not by their disability. So it works in other ways too. A woman who is Chinese versus that Asian chick, an old, a man who is old versus that old guy, or for me a lot of times, a person who is unpleasant versus that jerk. <laughs> it seems like such a simple thing, but it was the proverbial light bulb for me. God said, Seth, all around you, are people that I love. They are created in my image. They have souls. They will spend eternity somewhere. It changed the way that I saw folks, thought about them, communicated about them. And it made me more willing to listen. And if you remember me talking about my college experience and being fearful of engaging, 
this has really helped me engage with what is different. It was these things so many years later that so many of my experiences at Caldwell are so very relevant again. This is what all the worldview studies, the logic and critical thinking, the rhetoric, analytical literature and research, these things prepared me to engage with what is different. And they have prepared you the same. Outside of Caldwell is different. But you guys are ready. You are ready to go on to what is next. God has literally, literally given you tools to engage with people who are different, who have different religious views than you, political views, lifestyle views. I've heard 1 Corinthians 13 a million times, but verse 2 is so real to me now. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And to really love, it requires engaging. So will you, class of 2016, will you see those different from you as people? As with souls? As created in the image of God? Our culture has spent the past decade pounding into everyone that being tolerant can only be equated with embracing. That loving someone is the same as condoning all of their actions or even endorsing them. Things that would have been unthinkable when I graduated Caldwell 13 years ago, much less Carolina four years after that, are now commonplace in what is allowed, both legally and by our culture. Everyone is offended by something these days. Everyone. And in addition to being offended, the offendees expect that we care about their offense. If everyone's offended all the time as a collective culture, we can only hang on to caring for so long. And with this systemic apathy that is striking us right now as a collective culture, those who know Jesus, who know what is objectively right and wrong, who have studied his word in the way that you all have, who believe in him, those are the folks that will be able to fight apathy with his true love, of caring about those around us, those folks who are different, Because we, you all, have the capacity to see them as people created in the image of God. Created by God for a purpose. And God is faithful. God keeps reminding me that he loves me. And he keeps helping me see others as he sees them. So to go back to 1 John chapter 3, verse 23. And this is his command. To believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him, and he is in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. Trust him. He will be faithful to you. He will give you the eyes and the heart to see those around you as created in his image and to love them. So will you? Congratulations to you guys. I'm excited to see where you go.